morning. Welcome to our online service this morning. Hope you've had a very Merry Christmas, and uh, we're glad to see all of you, uh, be it through a camera. Hope that your travels have been good and uh, that you're safe and healthy. We're so thankful you're participating in worship with us this morning. Grateful to be together this morning and play and, uh, and sing these amazing songs of Advent as the Lord Jesus has arrived, and uh, we're thankful to celebrate that. Well, if you're at home with me, uh, and you would, uh, let's stand together uh, as we begin our worship together, reading from Hebrews chapter 10. Peace be with you, and also with you. We gather together this morning to worship Jesus, our Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us. Let us draw near in full assurance of God's endless love and mercy. We give our thanks and praise to Jesus Christ, who carries our sorrows, heals our wounds, and redeems us from our sin and death. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, what a reality that we get to worship this morning. Of all the things that we've worshipped, um, all the things that have caused us difficulty, even over this last month, strain and um, the things that, that drive us to be distracted from you, yet, Lord, you are unchanging, unwavering in your pursuit of us. Thank you for a celebration of Christmas. And Lord, as we uh, finish this year and begin to look to a new year uh, coming up, would you renew our hearts towards you and encourage us now? We pray this as we sing, as we receive, and even as we give. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. i 
thankful to be able to sing those songs and uh, just be reminded I would love to sing Christmas songs all year round (laughs) and one of the things I think when Christmas ends as as it has is uh, the feeling of the build-up of the anticipation which is so much of Christmas and then the day and then it's over and then you find yourself uh, having to say gosh I gotta take down all this stuff (laughs) and then little spaces and I've even mentioned this before to friends of how I'm often uh, amazed at all the little spaces where my uh, house has great decorations and beauty and even the tree itself and then when it's removed you're like how did it fit there before and why don't we have it here all year round all year round it's just that space that feels lonely it's, it's that sadness you know one of the things about confession is that it's not once a year It's not like Advent comes in seasons. Confession is God dealing with our sin uh, once and for all in Jesus and us being able to come to him over and over and knowing that it is always full. He always fills the space. There's never a moment where there's an emptiness and we're we're without in confession. It's actually just this fullness and overabundance of his grace and mercy in that. And as we're going to confess together and I love this time of confession because it allows us together as a church to confess even at home um, to confess our sin to to read together and have language that others have put to to help us even confess and then we get a time privately quietly silently 
to confess and to see all the spaces where God's grace overabundantly comes to fill and is never empty and it never stops. So with that, I want to read um, now our corporate confession. I'd love for you to read it with me at home. It should be on your screen from the Book of Common Prayer. We read this. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. In your mercy, Forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name, through Christ our Lord, amen. Take a moment and let your heart go before God, even with some of these words, to silently allow the Lord to see those spaces that you need to fill him for him to fill your grace. Lord, as I experience the finish of a year in these last remaining days and think of what uh, Christmas has meant, Lord, would you remind my heart and those of us worshiping together that Christmas does not end in a season just because it does for us as finite human beings. And because December will soon be gone. It is there in permanence. God, thank you that you deal with us, not in the way that we deserve, but you've dealt with us with mercy. Sweet mercy that comes to the places that we never would think, and not even ourselves, would be merciful towards. God, we confess those things that we are willing to confess, and also confess the things we're unwilling, because We don't even want to put words on them. And we pray that as we continue to worship this morning, you would remind us of the assurance that comes in Jesus Christ. As we just sang about Emmanuel, Lord, it it wasn't enough for you to deal with our sins by talking about it, but by dealing with it, by actually putting nails into your son and putting him on a cross so it would know tangibly that the sacrifice made for our sin is real, is as real as the sin we see. And his rising from the grave to defeat death, to rise again so that we may know in as much as that, as that our assurance is in the reality and history and truth and grace of the resurrection. We pray these things in our risen Savior's name. Amen. Would that be your assurance this morning as we Continue to even sing together and worship that you are reminded uh, your assurance in Jesus Christ is never going to change. There is nothing you can, no resolution for the new year, nothing that you can do or won't do that changes his mercy over you. Would we live in that assurance and the joy of that, the fullness of his grace, we pray. Let's sing together. and feet. 
stars together proclaim the holy word and praises sing to God the King and peace to all on earth. Oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord. Good morning, I'm Erin McCabe and I am the ministry director here at the Music Row location and I'm so glad that you're worshiping with us online today. Um, if I haven't connected with you yet, I would love to connect with you. And one way that we can connect is by letting us know that you're here today. And so you can go to christpres.org slash blackbook and let us know that you worshiped online with us. So coming up in the new year, there are going to be lots of ways for you to connect and serve. Our connect groups are going to be starting back again. We're going to have another round of four groups. There are lots of opportunities with missional communities. And then um, there are going to be a few specific ways you can connect and serve through National Institute for Faith and Work. Um, one is going to be in January. There's going to be a webinar um, led by Rosewyn Brooks um, going over the foundations of faith and work. So if you would like to know the basics of faith and work, tune in. Um, there will be more details coming. And then if you are a young professional, and you may be thinking, am I a young professional? Well, I'll tell you. If you are still able to be on your parents' insurance, like car insurance or um, health insurance, not car insurance, then you are a young professional. And coming up in February, we're going to have a webinar just for you um, on faith and work. And so more details are coming for that, but I hope that you will join us. So now I'm going to read today's scripture. It comes from Isaiah 53, 1 through 6. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Aaron. Well, I'm thankful to be able to preach the word to you this morning. It is from our last um, installment of uh, the book of Isaiah, which we've looked at all through Advent. And... Um, now our final one after uh, Christmas, uh, which I hope you've had a, a very merry and restful Christmas. This one, and uh, our next series, by the way, we're going to finish Isaiah today. And then our next series, starting in the new year, will be from Mark, which I'm super, super excited about. And it's going to be a great series. It's going to be for a number of weeks, even leading into Easter. And uh, we're just going to unpack the book of Mark, which is very simple 
gospel. Uh, it was the first gospel ever written. And uh, it was, uh, it's very short and impactful. It just answers the question, who's Jesus? <laughs> so we're going to look at that coming in the new year. One of the things, though, uh, looking back as we kind of reflect, you know, over this past Christmas and this whole year uh, has been 2020. It's been kind of a joke uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, I was watching TV the other day and uh, saw this commercial, uh, maybe you've seen it, where um, uh, it's Satan actually on a dating app, and it's a commercial for a dating app, and uh, he's looking for, uh, you know, somebody to date, and he's just like, you know, swiping and swiping. All of a sudden, he finds somebody, and uh, he meets her, and her name is 2020. And <laughs> so <laughs> Satan and 2020 start going out on a date. And uh, that, for a lot of us, has felt like what 2020 is, uh, has been just like er er messing with us. Uh, I think, you know, as we talk about New Year's resolutions, I'm not sure if that's what you're into, or maybe you are that. It's hard to even make those in some sense, uh, but maybe you could make some. Some of us have already done a lot of our resolutions because we've been stuck indoors, or maybe have done things we have wouldn't have done otherwise because we've been condensed and forced to, and that's what... A resolution sometimes means uh, to resolve to do something. But, I, I, you know, as we look at this passage <clears throat> from Isaiah 53, if you picked up on this, it's actually talking about grief. I, instead of trying to look at 2020 and saying, how can I punt this as far away from me as possible? It's actually saying, you know what, we should actually pick it up and hold it close. We should actually be looking at sorrow, loss, and grief with health. Uh, one of the things I, I want to make a disclaimer about as I talk about this morning is, is we talk about grief and kind of look into this. I'm not talking to you as a, as a psychologist. Uh, I'm talking to you as a pastor. I have a lot of dear friends, including my wife is a therapist, and uh, they are the experts to talk about in terms of uh, deeper depression and those kind of things, but I have learned a lot from them as well as having therapy myself. And what does it mean for us to really engage grief? What does the Bible mean for us to really engage the grief? You know, we just heard from Marissa singing that amazing, almost hauntingly beautiful song, A Little Town of Bethlehem. And there's a line in there, I don't know if you caught it, it says, the hopes and fears from all the years are met in thee tonight. Think about that. The hopes and fears of 2020 are met in Jesus right now. And that's what we're going to look at in this passage. That's what I think this passage is really unpacking for us as we look at grief. And we're going to look at two things from this. We're going to look first at how he was acquainted with grief. And then we're going to look at how he bore our grief, how he takes it on. So acquainted and born our grief you know who grieves uh it, when it first begins it says who's believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant like a root out of dry ground for he had no form or majesty that we should look at him no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief you know, this set of verses actually sits in a larger set, which would be a song. It'd almost be like drawing a couple stanzas out of your favorite song. You just get stuck in your head, and you sing them over and over. And I would say some of these lines <clears throat> are some of the most encouraging to me, and particularly struggling with grief. Everybody has been struggling with grief. Uh, everybody over this last year. I would say, in fact, I think we're all, even if we haven't admitted it, have been stuck because of COVID and and what other things a part of 2020 has done, whether it be a political season added and other such things, we've all been faced with grief and we've all been faced with trauma in a sense. And how are we, particularly as the church, going to navigate that? <clears throat> how do we navigate something like that? For decades, people have been walking through what's called the stages of grief. Uh, there was a great New Yorker uh, article called Good Grief. What's that mean? And, and revisited Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. But it said this in, in there, and I, I really appreciated it. It said, 
you know, it, it captured the imagination to have these categories of grief to understand, you know, first is, is sadness, then anger. And, you know, you kind of walk through the stages there. But it says grief can be far messier and tenacious. In fact, Elizabeth Cooper Ross, at the end of her own life, recognized how far astray our understanding of grief has gone. On grief and grieving, she even insisted that the stages were never meant to help us tuck messy emotions into neat packages. Yeah, and it is helpful. I, you know, even as I've talked to um, therapists or even good counselors about what people have gone through this year, why are so many people still just angry about this year? Why are so many people in this place? Well, one of the things they've said is many people are just stuck in a stage. They're stuck in, in, in a, could, could it be a stage of grief? But it is so messy. And it's not easy to tuck it into a nice package and, and feel like we can just you know, understand our grief well. We need to really hold it close. We need to not push it away. We need to just angry at it, not, but we need to process it. We need to engage it. This is why <clears throat> it says, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, that the person in this passage is saying they're acquainted with grief. They're actually really close to it. You know, the Charlie Brown Christmas, one of my favorite things, I, I even mentioned it before throughout this Advent, and I'm sure you will, hopefully you watched it. One of the things that Charlie Brown does is he, 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 he himself uh, will say, I'm depressed, Christmas season depressed, right? But what really depression is, isn't sadness, it's actually disengagement. It's actually disengaging from the reality of your grief rather than being acquainted with it. See, what, what this is saying, acquainted with grief, it says grief and sorrows, that there's a reality that we're to bring close. We're supposed to, we're supposed to be acquainted. And in fact, this man of sorrows is so acquainted, he brings it as close as he, it says a man of sorrows. He's actually named by the sorrows. Whereas depression can cause us to be disengaged. This is complete engagement. It's, it's being in and through it. And I think often when we hit grief, we hit a number of questions about it itself. Suffering, grief, sorrow, loss. We look across the span of 2020 or we look at anything that's been happening to us in the last number of years and we say, why is this happening to me? Grief forces us to say that. What, what's wrong with me? What do I need to course correct? What do I need to, what kind of resolution? You look to the 20, we're all looking to 2021, but look, 2021 is going to hold its own issues. A year isn't going to transform our whole lives. It's not going to change the way we interact with our grief. How do we grieve well? Because most of us, if you're like me and you're a human being, you ask the question, What's wrong with me? Or what did I do wrong? And we don't grieve well. So we try and disengage, whether it be through depression, whether it be through medication, whether it be something else. And again, I'm not saying you don't medicate grief. I think there is very healthy medication for grieving and those kind of things, depression. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I believe in those things. I believe you should have those things. But I also think even if you're good, getting good therapy, relationally, you still have to ask the question, how does medication, how does it all drive you to engage with your grief and pain? In fact, the Bible itself says for us to grieve, it says he is, Jesus himself said, blessed are those who mourn. That's his teaching in his life. He said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who actually engage with mourning of the things they see in themselves and around them. Because to engage that pain means you engage in the reality of what Jesus says, that this is not the way it's supposed to be. And in fact, as good therapists will tell you, good therapists who prescribe all sort of medication, good therapists who do EMDR and, and, and brain spotting and brain mapping are, 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 will all tell you the same thing. They will say to you, the real, what we're doing is engaging with the reality of the trauma, not pushing it away, engaging with it so we can understand it, but not do it alone. We have to grieve well. Ecclesiastes um, says it this way. Ecclesiastes is a book of, of wisdom. It was actually uh, written uh, by Solomon, one of the, the, uh, the greatest kings who was, who was wise. And to live in this world well, Proverbs and wisdom literature say, if you're going to make sense of good living, 
good living engages with grieving well. In fact, it says, for us to grieve well means sorrow and wisdom go together. Listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. You see what's being said here is that when we engage in sorrow, we're actually making more room for relationship, more room for love, more room for engagement. See, sorrow is the proper way to engage pain. Uh, Dan Allender, who's one of my favorite uh, writers, he and a man named Trimper Longman wrote a book on engaging. They wrote on uh, the relation, our relationship, our emotions in the Psalms. One of the things he says is this. He says, we forget that change comes through brutal honesty and vul- vulnerability before God. Only face to face with our deepest and ruling passions is there hope of redeeming the fabric of our inner world. It's us actually engaging the reality of who we are, the scary part of that. And here's the scary part of this passage. Verse 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. See, the struggle is what we do in our grief often is we try and navigate it ourselves. And for most of us, when we grieve in sadness, and I think we've realized more of this being isolated as we had been, but that we try and navigate our grief without others in it. We try and navigate grief without any relationship. Anyone actually meeting us there. Anyone actually coming with us into that pain. And it, because for us, the vulnerability and honesty, as Trimper Longman and Dan Allender, the therapists, have said, means we have to have someone really know our grief and know what we're sorrowful about. And to see us in a weak and vulnerable state. But the actual definition of hell is engaging pain alone. And that's what so many of us have felt. Not being able to touch someone. Not even being able to hug someone. Not even be able to, to engage except for through a screen. Which does give us face time. But we realize we need to talk to people and be in lives. Because we need people in our grief and sorrow. We're not meant to do it alone. We know that. We've had to be face to face with that. We've had to see that. One of the things when my son, uh, we asked both my sons, my older son who's 10, I'll ask him to clean his room and, and do those kind of things. And often his room is a super mess. <laughs> and he will start, and I will hear from his room yell out, Can someone come help me clean this? And he's not just saying it because he doesn't want to do all the work, which, sure, maybe that's there. But one of the, the sweetest things is to go in there, and when I, when I go in and help clean, I recognize that he begins to clean more. He begins to recognize the things that need cleaning, and he actually engages more in it if I'm doing it with him. And that's what this is saying to us. Engaging pain is not medicating, it's it's meeting somebody in it. It's not moving away from it. And when I say medicating, I don't mean like just pills and those things. I mean medicating so that we avoid seeing our pain. Good medication helps us engage it. But what this is saying is, I need to clean together. Can you come help me? Isn't there something so rich and beautiful when somebody says that to us or when we say that to somebody and they meet us in our grief and they begin to clean with us the mess they see we let them in the mess and actually let them touch and hold and tangibly see it and our grief is not alone and we don't feel like we're crying out in an empty room that's grief that's letting someone do that's That's the description of a man who's acquainted with it. See, I think it's interesting that it says in verse 2, For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should not look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. It means that there's a bunch of people looking on the outside at this person and saying, 
what's up with this guy? He obviously deserved this. But this is actually, the next verse is saying, he was despised and rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, because he voluntarily moved into the grief. That's what's incredible about what Jesus has done. (laughs) This passage is about a person who's saying, I see the grief and I'm going to move towards it. I'm going to even be named by it. So that verse four, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So much so is he acquainted with it that he is going to bear them. He wants to take them all. He's not just recognizing them and he doesn't want us to just recognize our need for someone to meet our grief. But he says, I'm going to bear them. I'm going to carry them. In fact, I will be named by them. Emily Dickinson, the great poet, wrote, um, wrote a poem on grief that I really enjoy. One of the things she says in it, <clears throat> she says at the beginning, she says, I measure every grief I meet with narrow probing eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has an easier side. She begins to unfold throughout the rest of the poem, looking at her grief and others' grief and trying to make sense of it. And in fact, it ends with her saying, I wonder if when years have piled some thousands on the harm that hurt them early, such a lapse could give them any balm. Asking the fact, is it, is it number of years, what causes the balm over the grief the Bible's saying it, that Jesus measured, he weighed our grief. He weighed a 2020. And 2020 was found wanting with the amount of his willingness to lean in to our sorrow. He measured it and took every ounce on himself. The language of born and carried is to teach us that there's no stone of your grief unturned by the Lord Jesus himself. There's no place in your room of your life or your heart, your emotions, the things around you, the pain that really is objectively there, that this person, this man, that is Jesus, was willing to be rejected and despised one whom men hide their faces. People couldn't even look at him. He was esteemed not. He was looked at like, what is this person's deal? (laughs) Something he did wrong. He must have messed up to receive all this suffering, to receive all this grief. He must have done something wrong. And isn't that what we feel? And yet here's such the reverse. Jesus puts himself in the position to experience all of those questions we have about our grief. It didn't, I, what did I do wrong to bear this? What, what is wrong with me that I would have such a horrible time, a horrible year, a horrible moment, a horrible tragedy, a horrible thing I see about myself, and yet Jesus willingly comes into that by bearing it himself. I remember even debating this passage with uh, some Jewish academic friends of mine, and one of the biggest questions over and over when I worked at Vanderbilt University was, could this, could this really be Jesus? I mean, could someone really come into that space and do that and accomplish this? It, it, it says he's rejected, a man of sorrows. Could Jesus do that? How do we know the reality of this is Jesus? How do we know that this is him? By how he bore them. Look at verse 5 here. It says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought peace, brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. He was pierced. This, this word pierced <clears throat> is only found in Isaiah, Isaiah itself. That word pierced, only found here to talk about someone who's fatally wounded. Someone who's fatally wounded on the account of someone else. That Jesus specifically puts himself in that position. God fatally wounded Jesus to be our substitute. One of the most profound passages to me, and one reason I believe Christianity the most of what I do, if you want a little window into my own heart, 
is how God engages grief. The number of sufferings and grief, and, and everybody has their story. I have mine, you have yours, and, and, and God meets us there. But it's how Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he faces the Lord himself, and he faces the temptation, and he says, he says to God this, as he's praying, he's sweating drops of blood, and this is literally the night before he's arrested to be taken to be put on the cross, and he's being tempted to be unfaithful to God. He allows his soul to feel the most crushing sense of things that any of us could feel by saying, and he says this, my soul is sorrowful. This is Matthew 26. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And what he was doing in that moment that is so profound for the multitude of sufferings that I've encountered and that you have encountered, that I hear and I sit with people in and I talk to you about, is that Jesus positions himself to say, God, I really don't want to do this. I really feel so much sorrow. It says the Son of God was dying of sorrow in order that he could go to the most realistic picture of sorrow, the cross. That the cross is the meeting, it is the proof that Jesus willingly puts himself in a position to be pierced, to say, I'm gonna go into the heart of death itself. That the reality of sin and suffering is true because the cross exists. And because the cross exists, suffering and sorrow and death are true, and they meet there. And he allows himself to be pierced. He was crushed for our iniquities, crushed the weight of Christ. The, the, the beauty of that <clears throat> image, and I'm sure that you've felt it, the weight of something on your shoulders. I remember backing out of the driveway. My kids leave things in the driveway all the time. So if I hear a, a loud bang or a noise, I think, oh gosh, okay, what was left under the car or rolled under the, the car while I was backing out? I didn't see, I didn't pay attention. One of the things that they've left out before was a bouncy ball. And you think one of those bouncy balls, you know, uh, just bounce forever or go all over the place? I remember the, the weight and sound of this thing under the tire and not realizing what it was and the compression of, you know, thousands of pounds of a automobile tire pressing down on what really shouldn't you, you would ever think explode just burst into a million pieces this is the weight that Jesus is taking on the suffering servant as he's called here has been one to who's sent to encounter the crushing weight of sin in fact the Hebrew word for forgiveness means to lift off because the crushing weight of sin is so much, we actually can't carry it. And I am so prone to think, as, as whether it be my makings or whatever it is, growing up as an only child in a single parent home, uh, my own weavings and particular patterns, which I'm sure you have as well, to think, okay, this, this is a type of sin, oh yeah, it's heavy, but I, I can totally, I can put my shoulder down, you know, I can do enough work to get past it or be strong enough to continue to carry it or hold it. But this is a weight that's saying crushed by our iniquities. It's saying there's so much weight there of ours taken off and placed on him because we have to understand what forgiveness is, is a lifting off of us and putting on him. All of the weight that you feel, all of the, I mean, if there's a, a perfect illustration of grief, it's just the, your shoulders just feeling that the hard moments to be able to breathe because you're just suffocated by the crushing weight. There's nothing more rich and beautiful when somebody is with you and you begin to express your grief, you engage your pain and they engage it with you and you feel just a sense of that weight being lifted, just a little bit of, of that. Yes, it's still there, there's still a weight that's been taken off. In the objective reality of Jesus, 
every part of that is taken off. And that is why forgiveness means lifted off. It means it's taken off in our relationship with him and put on him. A chastisement of <clears throat> what it says here, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. He doesn't try to, to numb it. If there's anything that Jesus doesn't do, he does not avoid pain. You know, it, it, when he engages And you would think this, and a lot of people think this of Christianity, think this of religion, but particularly Christianity is that we're just trying, we're disengaged from the world. (laughs) But Christians should be so engaged in this world because we get what God has done in it and know what's coming next. Jesus himself in one of the most profound passages in John, this Gospel of John, is asked about one of his dearest friends, Lazarus, who's died. And you would think that he knows uh, he's dead. Uh, and he actually raises, the punchline is he raises Lazarus from the dead. And everybody's amazed and it's just uh, uh, incredible. But in between that, you would think this is Jesus. He's got the, he knows exactly he's gonna, he's gonna raise him from the dead. There's no emotion. It's, but in between there, it says two smaller, it says Jesus wept. And the language of that weeping is, one of a wild animal. It's of an animal that is snorting and raging so much. It's, not a, it's almost not even just a sadness. It's an anger and it's a grief and chastisement. He, there's, a, there's, a, there's an engagement of that. He's so in that. He engages his pain with both his closest friends and his enemies so much so that Jesus is willing to take on every grief, the chastisement that brought us peace. He was chastised. Someone who was innocent. Someone who had no, no qualms with this world. He took the chastisement that many of us feel towards our sorrow and grief. The, the way that we find the finger pointing. The way we, here is an innocent one. The only one put on the cross for us. And it says, by his wounds we are healed. You know, the Hebrew here It says, he literally took the blows of pain. This passage is so overly descriptive of of who this person is, that it is Jesus. That in every step, every, every footprint made on this earth, that Jesus says, I'm going to identify so much so with grief, not only be named by it, but you will receive the overabundance of mercy, as he says, upon him and with his wounds, with the blows that were rained down upon him, we were healed. <clears throat> and one of the verses that's not written in here that I love from Isaiah 53, verse 10, says this. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his day. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That it actually, ple- this is almost the, this craziest idea that God actually was pleased in his will to crush his own son. Because 2020 isn't just something he punts in the past. It's something he deals with. It's something that he died for. It's us, in us, to redeem us through his son that he goes through every length imaginable to bear our grief, to become even the sorrows so that we can look and resolve for 2021 in a different way, not because we hope that it's better, but because we know that it is, that our God in Jesus Christ It was his will to crush him so that we might be made his. Praise be to God for 2020 because he is not silent and he has not left us. And he will be just as faithful in 2021 as he has been in 2020 to bear our grief, to lift off our sin and to place on us continually everlasting in Christ's blood his forgiveness. Amen. Let me pray for us.
God, thank you that the cross is a literal, tangible picture of you addressing grief and sorrow. Thank you that even before you went to it, you were engaging the cross. You were engaging it even in the Garden of Gethsemane. You fell and and your sweat became drops of blood because you were so profoundly attached to our sin that created grief. You so profoundly attached yourself to our sorrow, which you didn't need to, and our mess, and you entered in so that we would not only just cry out to you, and we didn't help you clean anything. You came into our space, our room, our lives, and you did all of the cleaning. You met us in every space and put everything back together by taking your very own son apart and chastising him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Praise be to God for this truth. We pray in the matchless name and through the blood of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Now Jonas is singing in Christ alone from your homes.
sing our doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise be to God. Love singing that together. Well, thank you again for joining us this morning. I hope you have a happy new year, and I'm so thankful uh, that the Lord has been faithful to us. If you would like now to raise your hands and your hearts to receive the Lord's benediction wherever you are, or may that one who in the hopes and fears of all the years met in him tonight, that is Jesus, be with you now in the end of 2020 and all through 2021. Praise be to God. Amen. Go in peace.